What's going on guys? Derek here from Wilson Audio Labs. Today we're going to look at a Rockford Fosgate Power 1000. Those from the old school may remember the Mac Daddy Power 1000C with the LED indicators and all that from way back in the day. Massive amplifiers. These were big money, almost $3,000 back in the day. I'll leave a link in the video description. I have a several videos on this amp. One showing it powers some subs, another one with amp dyno tests and some other stuff like that. So make sure you check that out if you want to see the grandfather of the amp we're going to show you today. Now there's another version of the Power 1000 that I did not have to show you, which is the 25 to life version, which came out around 2005. And this amp was huge. It's hard to tell by the pictures, just extremely large and also a five channel. But today we're going to talk about a mini five channel amp, the T1000X5AD can see here on the Rockford Fosgate site, $669 is the retail price. We'll take a closer look at the amp here. It says it's 1000 watts, class AD, five channel, has a lot of different features, including the constant power feature, which is a feature we really like, because when you use this with subwoofers, it really helps out to give you that power along the way. It also has the clean setup, it's CEA 2006 compliant, it has three-stage airflow, and it's engineered in the U.S., and Sam's going to talk about that later in this video, and that's very important, and it adds to the cost, obviously. As far as ratings, 100 watts by 4 at 4 ohms, 100 watts by 4 at 2 ohms, and then at 4 ohms, you get a 400 watt on the sub-channel, 2 ohms, you get 600 watts on the sub-channel, and then 1 ohm, you get 600 watts on the sub-channel as well, and you can bridge the four channels down to 2 for 200 by 2. Again, the size of this amp is pretty small, you can see here compared to my hand. We'll also give you the physical dimensions, 12 inches or 305 millimeters on the long side, by 4.3 inches or 108 millimeters on the width. And then we'll show you the height here, which is not very much. It's 1.6 inches or about 41 millimeters. So this fits under most seats and most vehicles and way smaller than the other Power 1000 that I showed you in earlier pictures. You can see here on the far left side, you have all the controls. I'm going to go over those here shortly. But first off, we're going to look at each end of the amp and see about the different connections for input and output. On one end, we have the input for front, rear, and sub. There's a two to four channel switch, also the remote base level. Now, when you use the inputs here, you can use RCAs or snip them off and use them with high level. On the opposite end, we have the front and rear speaker outputs. We have B plus ground and remote and also the sub and those come on these little removable connectors and I'll show you a closer look of the removable connector coming up right here and you can see this one is designed it says four gauge but if you have oversized four gauge you're gonna have a hard time fitting them so I had to shave down a little bit and then with the subwoofer channel you can easily fit eight gauge in there so that's no problem hook your plus and minus up the nice thing about these is you can pull them out if you need to if you need to remove the amp for quickly then it's easy to do that so I like them in that method I'm not too crazy about the pigtails but I understand why they have to do it for the speaker leads and for the others speaking of the speaker leads here you can see the pigtails and also you can see I have connected here a terminal block check the video description below I'll have a link to where you can pick one of these up on Amazon again as I mentioned before having these options removable for power ground speaker leads and everything makes it very simple for removing the amp. Now on the top of the amp you have the clip indicators for input, EQ, and also frequency adjustment, as well as a subwoofer output switch and an infrasonic filter that's built in that's set to one frequency. Now for the part you guys want to see, let's fire up the old amp dyno. Let's run some tests on the front channels as well as the sub channels, see how the amp performs. All right, first up, we're going to show the 4 ohm test. It's rated 100 watts by 4 plus 400 by 1 for the sub channel. First off, we're going to show the front channels. And certified test takes us up to 1% THD. You can see we easily got that 100 watts, 129 and 132 at 13.7. Uncertified takes us up to clipping. We used a 1 kilohertz signal for this particular test. And again, we easily got over the 100 watts, uh, over 150, 154, 157 at 14.14. Dynamic burst sends a pulse tone into the amp. We used a 1 kilohertz tone here. 
right at 160 watts, 158 and 159, right at 14.4 volts. So very good. Nice performance here for the Rockford 1000 watt amp. On the sub channel, it's rated 400 by one, and the certified test again stops it at 1% THD. We got 440, 14.22, again surpassing the rating as we usually expect with Rockford amps. Uncertified takes us up to the clipping point, which we expect to be a little bit more, and it is 444 at 14.23. And the final test here for 4 ohms is going to be the dynamic test at 40 hertz on the sub channel. And right about 451 watts at 14.5, and, and it jumped a little bit there, 453, 14.5. All right, next up we'll try the 2 ohm test again constant power rated 100 by 4 on the front channel 600 by 1 on the sub channel first off we'll test the front channels see what we have rated 100 watts by 4 at 14.4 volts and again easily obtain that 154 151 at 14.2 for the certified test now instead of showing you every test on the front channels i switch it to the sub channel for the 600 watt rating, let's see what we get here certified. You can see 737 watts at 14.1 volts, so very well over the rated power. Uncertified on the sub channel, we expect it to do just a little bit better than the other test, which it does. Check this out, 767 watts at 14.35, very nice. Dynamic burst, we're gonna send a 40 hertz pulse tone into the amp, see what it'll do. And yep, Rockford amps usually have good dynamic power. It's good for dynamics, for playing back kick drum type music. 802 watts at 14.41 volts. Now the final test we're gonna show here is one ohm and it's only the sub channel because the front channels are not rated to handle that. So we'll show you certified first, again rated 600 by one. This is the constant power that we talked about before between one and two, one and two ohms and 812 watts, 13.94. So nicely over the rated power again. Uncertified takes us up to clipping, 40 hertz tone. And yep, even more, 821 at 13.95. Nice performer here for such a small amplifier. Dynamic power, 40 hertz pulse tone. <laughs> this one blew me away, look at this. 1,284 watts at 14.4 volts. Yeah, this amp has got some reserve power built in. Very nice. All right, so after all the brutal tests, we decided to go ahead and measure the temperature. And I've been told these amps do get hot and you can see 121 degrees there, 122. So they do, but they're very efficient in their cooling. So here are the results. And we like to say, keeping with the tradition. That's right, Rockford are always known to be underrated. You can pause this if you want to see all the results, but yeah, it, it beat its rating in every single test by quite a bit. So you get what you pay for when you buy one of these. You get reliability, and we're going to have Sam talk about the design of the amp and some more coming up here. So instead of me talking about it, we'll let him talk about it. But before we get there, let's talk about what's inside. I did get this picture from Rockford to kind of show me a breakaway of how the amp comes apart because it's such a pain to do. First off, you have to take the emblem off, and there's a single screw under the emblem. Once you take that one screw off, you flip it over to the bottom, and you have to peel the sticker off, and, and the sticker reveals four more screws. Take these four screws out, then you can finally get the end plates off, and then you're almost there, but not quite, because there's still <laughs> quite a bit to do. And I'm going to show that here as we go through it. Pull the end plates out. And everything is machined with very tight tolerances, so everything is very tight. And I then had to pop off this little panel here on the top for the input switches and gain controls and everything. And here you can see the amp. Now, the amp slides out of the case, but it was extremely difficult to do this. And I didn't have my tripod set up, so I couldn't use two hands but um, and hold the camera. But I can show you here. Here is the guts of the amp. I did get it slid out again, super, super tight tolerances here, holding everything together. I did also take off some of the screws here for the clamp so that Sam could get a better idea of what the amp was all about. So make sure you check out youtube.com slash bearvids for Sam's stuff, but I'm allowing Sam to tell us his opinion 
of this rock for 1,000 watt amp. Take it on, Sam. Okay then. Unlike many great brands from back in the day which have turned south, Rockford Fosgate have stayed true to delivering innovative, high quality products to this day. And this amplifier here is no exception. As always, I have big respect for any manufacturer creating a bespoke circuit design unique to them rather than selecting a cookie cutter copy pasted circuit from one of a few factories and slapping their badge on the front. It is not cheap to employ your own amplifier design engineers, so of course you will pay a premium for this stuff, but the end result is often worth the investment. You can tell just by looking at this thing that the designers took every possible measure to cram this thing down as small as physically possible. There isn't an inch to spare in here, big ass caps on their side to keep it slim, everything surface mount with hardly any empty PCB. The way the inductors here are angled to fit alongside each other due to the larger rail cap and all this glue so they can't touch each other and rub. And check out these riser cards that are double sided and crammed full of components. Let's start with the power supply. As I can't get a good look at the driver boards, I can't confirm the architecture, but it'll either be your standard TL494 chip as used in 99% of car amps, SG3525 chip, or a PIC with internal PWM generator like the tar amps. The power supply FETs used here are beast as IRFB7437 are no joke with a whopping 1000 amp pulse drain current and low boy RDS of 1.5 milliohm. This will allow for reliable call operation even driven hard all day in the summer. The preamp filter circuits are mostly on these riser boards and I think it's really nice that they have included not only clip lights for each channel pair but also an input signal clip light which you can use to make sure the output from your head unit is clean. Let's look at the output section. Rockford call this class AD which is not an officially recognized amplifier architecture. Instead it's just branding. The 4 channel section of this amplifier is clearly class D, going by the 4 2092 drivers here and the 4 output filter inductors here. This fifth larger inductor will be for the 600 watt sub channel, and I assume the drive circuit for that is going to be on this card here. Now, in terms of output FETs, we have 8 times IRFB4115 along this end, which you may recognize as the same FETs as used in the Tyrant Smart 3 and the Base 3K. However, it is unclear to me if these FETs are for the 4 channel section or the sub channel. Part of me thinks these are ran as a pair of FETs per channel full range, channel 1, 2, 3 and 4, one high side FET and one low side FET. But then if that's the case, where are the sub channel FETs? I can't see the 600 watt sub channel requiring 8 of these FETs considering how Taramps get 3k RMS out of just 4 of them. But supposing these were for the sub-channel alone, the 4-channel FETs could be these really cool surface mount ones on the underside of the board with thermal pads to the top of the heatsink as I've seen done in many Alpine amps recently. In fact, I'm actually willing to bet there's a whole bunch of circuitry going on on the other side of this PCB as well. Either way, this is a lot of power and a lot of channels in not a lot of space. Both the 4-channel section and the sub-channel deliver constant power across a range of impedances, 2 to 4 ohm on the 4-channel section and 1 to 2 ohm on the sub. Apparently, this is Rockford's patented constant power technology, so its design will differ from the likes of the Smart 3, but it's still going to be some form of signal limiting based on output current sensing, and just hopefully a lot cleaner. If you want to learn more about current mode clip, then go and watch my explanation in the Smart 3 overview video, there'll be a link in the description. I am absolutely in favour of the adoption of constant power amps and I'm looking forward to seeing it spread throughout the market. Other cool things worth mentioning here is how thermal pads have been used on the FET clamps as well as the FET backs since heat emits from both sides of the FET this will help with cooling. There are also a pair of fans squeezed into the end plate here and it seems like the airflow has actually been thought out rather than just eh, chuck a fan here it'll be right. The components that Rockford select for these amplifiers are high quality tight tolerance parts and I love the little signature marks of the various engineers who worked on the designs of Rockford amps which you may have seen before in the past. There's barely any room for them on this one though but I can just about make one out here and there's one here and there's another one here. Overall what we are looking at here is an extremely well designed all in one high power device that is capable of running an entire system to levels once reserved for the realms of separated much larger amplifiers. Easy to install without ruining the OEM look while providing fully aftermarket sound potential. Good job Rockford, keep it up. Alright Sam, thanks again for that excellent overview of this Rockford 5 channel amp. As you can tell, he really likes the design and how Rockford does unique things. 
Now, I did do some tests with subwoofers, but unfortunately I played all copyrighted music, not any of the YouTube music, so I can't let you guys hear any of that or my video get flagged and taken down. So that's a bummer, I know. Go ahead and insert Big Dummy clip right now. You big dummy. All right, so <laughs> I'm back. But yeah, overall, I really like the amp. Uh, it did not come with a bass knob, so you have to buy that separately if you want. Again, you're paying more for Rockford amps because of the quality, the design. They're designed here in the U.S., so um, they use unique designs, not anything that's bought off the shelf. So you are going to pay more, but I would expect these to last longer. And actually, this one is a refurbished amp that obviously whoever re repaired it did a great job because I didn't have any problems with it other than trying to take it apart. That's a different story because it was a bit of a pain. So I want to thank my Patreon supporters, patreon.com slash old school stereo. Check us out over there. You can support us for as little as $1 a month. And we also have some additional people to thank legends of car audio bear vids high five vega vintage stereo buff steamy designs eric simpson stewart son i'm out of here so i bought this new o-scope to use because i've had a lot of people complain about hey you're just using the dyno i can't really see what the amp is doing especially the electrical engineer type people the audio purist the uh, people who are really hesitant that this thing does a proper job so the only issue with what's going on today is i couldn't fit this in the the shot so i'm actually planning to rebuild my bench and i'm gonna have a whole new setup i'm gonna have this and also i have a hp thd analyzer that i'm gonna have hooked in my system as well so that we can have all different kind of measurement devices you guys can see in addition to the amp dyno. Now, the one thing you will notice, or the one thing you may not notice, but I do, the dyno is actually analog. So it measures things much quicker than these digital scopes. These digital scopes have a delay. Uh, they're doing so much math and all that stuff. They just are not as quick. So if you're trying to compare, you know, A to B or B to A, whatever, and if I show them at the same time, you're not going to see things happen exactly at the same time here as you do on the dyno. So in the future, I'll explain that again, I'm sure, because people are going to ask. But just want to let you know I am getting some more test equipment, so you will be seeing this in the future.